A foolish decision now could wreck your whole life. In ten years, you'll never know this even happened. Dad, answer her. Stand up! You want to kill your own father! 1950s Hollywood was a happening time, and James Dean was a happening dude. Jimmy made a big impression, playing a rebel without a cause. You're tearing me apart! But is that really what a rebel looks like? Because after all, James Dean was just an actor. And while Jimmy was faking it out there on the big screen, we had a real rebel up here in Canada. Granted, our guy didn't much look the part. Kind of geeky, scrawny, and not technically cool. But our guy wasn't playing a part. He was living it. His name was Tommy Douglas, and he fought for a better Canada, one where no one got left behind. Tommy Douglas is best known as the guy who gave us Medicare, but there's much more to him than that. Tommy took Canada down a more civilized road, even when we weren't so sure that we wanted to go that way. He was an unlikely rebel, and to me, he's our greatest Canadian. Welcome to a dark, shadowy world. The natural habitat of the used car dealer. Used car dealers are the least trustworthy, most morally compromised creatures on Earth. Well, with one notable exception. Politicians. How do you feel about them these days? I mean, you know the routine. They'll tell you what you want to hear, do nothing. Suddenly, it's four years later, and they're back looking for more love. Well, you know, there was once a politician who not only made big promises, but he actually kept them. And he did it for half a century. In fact, Tommy Douglas made the rest of them seem like a bunch of used car salesmen. Tommy was truly a man of the people. It was for them that he went into politics in the first place. And that never changed. Campaigning here in 1968, Tommy's handlers were really riding him to get a move on. Bad idea. Way, way behind schedule. Oh, all right, we're going to stop. Just a Tommy would never turn his back on the people. He dedicated his life to making our lives better. And you know what? He pulled it off. Tommy is our leader. Oh, Tommy is the leader. Tommy Douglas, the man best known for giving us Medicare, left us a legacy far larger than that. He is an inspiration to our nation. I want you to say with me in your heart of hearts, I shall not cease from mental strife, nor shall my sword rest in my hand till we have built Jerusalem in this green and pleasant land. Thank you. So who exactly was Tommy Clement Douglas? Well, for those of you who need a little refresher on our greatest Canadian, 
Here's Tommy's life in a nutshell. Tommy was born in Falkirk, a grim industrial town in central Scotland. Things were tough for his working class parents. So they all moved to Canada for a better life. Except it wasn't any better here than it was there. So they went back to Scotland. Tommy got a job making corks for whiskey bottles, paying his own way by the age of 14. But then his folks decided Canada was better after all. And so the family set up residence in Winnipeg. All growed up, Tommy became a Baptist minister. He got himself a wife, Irma, who had a daughter, Shirley, who married a movie star. They had a son, who also became a movie star, Kiefer. In the meantime, Tommy became Premier of Saskatchewan, before moving to the political stage in Ottawa, where he fought and won a series of battles, making Canada the caring, sharing country it is today. But caring and sharing? Well, that was a tough sell back in the early 1900s. To really understand what made Tommy our greatest Canadian, you have to go right back to when he was a teenager, living in Winnipeg, Manitoba. In 1919, workers called a general strike and took to the streets to protest pitifully low wages. And they sure didn't get any sympathy at City Hall. In fact, what they got was a fight. The mayor gave the order, send in the Mounties. The RCMP roared up this section of Portage Avenue on horseback. By the time they hung a left on Main Street, well, it was showtime, because waiting for them over there were a bunch of strikers. By the time the cops actually clashed with the crowd, they were so jacked that they just opened fire. There was a hail of bullets, and over 20 people got shot. They even killed a man. And Tommy, well, he saw the whole thing go down from a nearby rooftop. But the message from the Fat Cats was pretty clear. If you dare to protest against your own exploitation, we will beat you into submission. Tommy Douglas was deeply affected by what he saw in Winnipeg. Working people just weren't getting the breaks, and Tommy wanted to make a difference. So the man who would transform the nation trained as a Baptist minister. In 1930, still only 26 years old, Tommy took his first position at a church in Weyburn, Saskatchewan. Back then, church ministers were often fire and brimstone merchants. Believers should put up with life's miseries and wait for their reward in the afterlife. Well, Tommy wasn't buying it. He was a practical guy, and he wanted to help out in the here and now. Am I my brother's keeper? The answer that comes back to our heart and conscience is always yes. Tommy spent much of his time helping his poorest parishioners, people who barely had enough to eat. And when miners in nearby Estevan went on strike over their appalling living conditions, Tommy got involved, doling out blankets and food. Tommy Douglas's stature as our greatest Canadian can be traced all the way back to these early acts of kindness and compassion. And then the little people got squashed all over again. The RCMP opened fire on the protesting miners. This time, they shot and killed three young men. The murder of these three men hit Tommy hard and became a turning point in his life. He'd had it. Things needed to change, and he was going to be the one to change them. So Tommy stepped down from the pulpit and into the world of politics. The rebellion had begun. Tommy knew that in order to make any real impact on the lives of the working poor, he was going to have to step it up. And he found common cause with a fledgling political party called the CCF. The aim of the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation is the establishment in Canada by democratic means of a cooperative commonwealth in which the supplying of human needs and the enrichment of human life shall be the primary purpose of our society. 
In a few short years, Tommy Douglas and his ragtag band of reformers turned the CCF into a potent political force. The time has come for us to break away from the old line parties and to elect a government that will represent all those who with hands and brains produce the wealth of this country. Then, Tommy got the call, accepting the job of party leader in Saskatchewan. And so, he set his sights on this place, the ledge in Regina. But the liberals who ran the joint, well, they were in no mood to roll over. Nothing can be quite so resentful as a man who has ridden on your back for 50 years, and then you make him get off and walk. The Grits had been running Saskatchewan for so long, they acted as if they owned the place. And they would do anything to prevent that from changing. With money and the media in their pockets, they took negative campaigning to a whole new level. And Tommy's enemies, they would just make stuff up. Constantly portraying Tommy and the CCF as some band of marauding Bolsheviks. <laughs> Liberal-friendly newspapers gleefully reported an endless stream of slurs. This was no less than Blitzkrieg on the Prairie, the invasion of Saskatchewan. And the farms would be the first to go if the CCF won power, controlled by the state who would dictate to farmers everything that should be grown. And the lies just kept on coming. A CCF government would use military and police force and espionage that would soon go the way of Mussolini and Hitler dictatorships. Wow. And how do you think Tommy reacted? Did he rant and rave like any other self-respecting politician? Nope. Tommy told jokes. Mouseland was a place where all the little mice lived and played. And, and every time on election day, all the little mice used to elect a government. A government made up of big, fat, black cats. <laughs> they passed good laws. That is, laws that were good for cats. <laughs> and when the mice couldn't put up with it anymore, they decided something had to be done about it. They voted the black cats out. And they put in the white cats. <laughs> Presently, there came along one little mouse. And he said to the other mice, Look, fellas, why do we keep on electing a government made up of cats? Why don't we elect a government made up of mice? Oh, they said he's a Bolshevik. Lock him up. <laughs> Tommy was a huge hit with the prairie crowd. Well, not only did he speak their language, but he understood their problems. And what's more, Tommy had big ideas on how to solve them. And man, oh man, did the liberals ever know they were in trouble. One even said, Tommy doesn't need to kiss babies anymore because the babies are busy trying to kiss Tommy. And so it was that in 1944, Tommy triumphed. His brand of conviction politics blew the Liberals out of the water. The CCF won 47 of 52 seats. From a farmer, soldier, laborer, from the mine and factory, and side by side we'll swell the tide. CCF to victory. But Tommy's convictions didn't always win him popularity. In fact, for the most part, he was ahead of the times. Back in 1936, Tommy had gone to Germany, where he checked out one of those chest-thumping Nazi party rallies. Tommy quickly saw Hitler for what he really was, a lunatic with a dodgy mustache intent on taking over the world. Tommy denounced Hitler when many of our politicians were still insisting he was a really nice guy. 
A year after Tommy's trip to Deutschland, Liberal Prime Minister Mackenzie King described Adolf as one who truly loves his fellow men. King went on to say that Hitler's skin was smooth and that he had an affectionate look in his eyes. What? But then plenty of things seem bizarre in hindsight. You see, Tommy had a knack for knowing right from wrong at the time. The bigger question was, how long would it take the rest of us to catch up? Thirty years later, Tommy was still way ahead of the curve. The conflict in Vietnam was escalating, and Tommy broke ranks with the other political parties to condemn the war. The United States is back at the old game, trying to buttress up discredited regimes and trying to force on people governments that they don't want. Well, it sounds like a no-brainer now. But criticizing the Vietnam conflict back then took real political courage. The anti-war movement was still in diapers when Tommy made his stand. And it was the same story when it came to Tommy's private life. In 1969, his activist daughter Shirley got arrested on trumped-up charges while she was living down in Los Angeles. She was accused of storing explosives for the radical group the Black Panthers. Now, a lesser man might have steered clear of the controversy to preserve his political reputation. But Tommy was definitely not a lesser man. His daughter needed him, and he flew down to L.A. right away. Besides, Tommy the Rebel kind of liked it when the odds were stacked against him. I hate to keep asking you all these questions, but you're not too well known down here, sir. We want to know you better. Oh, well, uh, uh, you'll sir, get a chance to do that. Sir, do you feel disappointed that your daughter did not show up to meet you? Well, I'm not sure she hasn't shown up to meet me. You haven't people haven't given me any, any chance to find out whether she met me or not. She hasn't. Uh, how do you know? She's not here. How do you know? I haven't seen her. Well, the fact you haven't seen her doesn't mean a thing. <laughs> You've been you standing at the very door as I come in, and uh, I don't know how I'd get a chance to see her or, or her to see me. Fine, sir. So uh, I don't think you have jumping. Hello, honey. Hi. Hi. That's the door. <laughs> <laughs> this is a gentleman just telling me that you're not here. Oh, I've been uh, here, yeah. He's been here all along. How do you feel uh, about it? I think, I think maybe you oh, prejudge that the same way some of you are prejudging the, the, the case. Lots of people have great ideas on how to make this country a better place. But getting it done? Well, that's a different story. Tommy Douglas gave us Medicare and much more. And he did it in the face of enormous resistance. That's the thing. See, Tommy would stick his neck out as far as it would go just to fight for something that he believed in. That's not just rare in a politician. That's rare in a human being. And time and time again, he blazed the trail that the rest of us would follow. How could you possibly vote for anybody else? In order to fully grasp what Tommy Douglas accomplished, you've got to take a look at what he was up against and what it was like before he took over. Saskatchewan in the 1930s was a pretty grim place. They were going through the Great Depression, but there was also one of the worst droughts in history. And those two things combined brought the province to its knees. But Tommy was used to poverty, but this, nah, this was something else. These days, we've seen those grainy old images of Depression-era poverty so many times that they've lost their power to shock. But out in the countryside, life had hardly changed since the first settlers came through in the 1800s. Primitive housing, no electricity, no water mains, and no decent medical care, at least none that most people could afford. It was absolutely brutal. True to form, Tommy started making changes as soon as he became premier. And the old guard, well, they were still trying to turn the public against him with scare stories about a new Soviet-style Republic of Saskatchewan. Well, Tommy turned things upside down all right, but that's only because they were the wrong way up to start with.
So what exactly did Premier Tommy C. Douglas do? Well, how about this? There were just 138 miles of paved road in the province when Tommy came to power. So he built thousands of miles of new blacktop. Tommy also did motorists another big favor when he brought in North America's first ever government auto insurance policy. The new plan's premiums were 20% less than anywhere else in the country. And drinking was man's business in Saskatchewan until Tommy relaxed the liquor laws, allowing women into bars. Tommy even forced begrudging employers to guarantee their employees a minimum of two weeks vacation. That's paid vacation, hallelujah. And electricity, which until now had only been available in the big cities, was finally rolled out across the whole province. The lights had come on in Saskatchewan. Oh, and uh, just uh, one other little thing here. Human rights. Tommy outlawed discrimination on the grounds of race or gender with his 1947 Bill of Rights. The bill was the first of its kind anywhere in North America. Tommy even beat the United Nations to it. Their declaration of human rights came 18 months later. Copycats. So how about that? A politician that actually improves things, and then some. By the time Tommy was done, he would not even have recognized the place. But the naysayers were always on about how, oh, that's too expensive or too ambitious or too complicated. <sighs> like that was gonna stop Tommy. Not only did he get all that wonderful stuff done, but he did it while balancing the budget for 17 years straight. The guy was unstoppable. Tommy just wouldn't quit fixing things up. He even went after these. Can you imagine just how miserable it must have been to use an outside toilet in the middle of a prairie winter? Yeah. Outhouses were still the norm in rural Saskatchewan when Tommy came in, but he soon saw them off with a huge public works program building municipal sewers. Understandably delighted country folk took to torching their obsolete outhouses in celebration, and that had been celebrating too. The image of outside Johns burning against the night sky was for a while a completely routine sight in Saskatchewan. But somehow, this one got away. Don't worry, I'm gonna send it to the Outhouse Underworld where it can join all its buddies. And hey, Mr. Outhouse, this is for all of the Canadians that have to traipse through the snow and sit their sweet behinds on your splintery pines. I'd like to dedicate this to the great Tommy Douglas. Hey, Mr. Outhouse, go to hell. Oh, so good. Saskatchewan was the poorest, most underdeveloped province in Canada when Tommy took charge. But by the time he left, it was proud, prosperous, and progressive. Tommy's achievements were a beacon to the rest of the nation, a living, breathing example of where good ideas and gumption can take you. This here's the story of what Tommy had done once he won the Battle of Saskatchewan. How he gave the stack the very prize. He thought it gone forever and died. He talked and talked and tried to persuade. Finally proved it to be made. Them grits, they said he was a gosh darn commie, but that didn't trouble dear old Tommy. Stuck to his guns and did what he said he would do. The greatest battle was the yet to come. The battle is said could not be won, but good old Tommy fought on and on in the name of Medicare. What do the following have in common? A bottle of chloroform, a doctor's top hat, and a prosthetic limb. Well, they all played a part in giving us the one thing that Canadians consistently rate as our greatest national treasure, universal health care. Back when Tommy Douglas was seven years old, he developed a pretty serious leg infection, and his parents couldn't afford to send him to a hospital, so a doctor came over to check it out. Now, here's what they did. Knocked him out with chloroform and laid him on the kitchen table. 
and then cut in to try to scrape away at the infection. Well, surprise, surprise, but that didn't exactly work. So Tommy came this close to getting one of these. It's just that amputation should never even have been an option, but his parents couldn't afford to get Tommy the proper medical attention. The truth is, back then, the majority of Canadians couldn't afford even the most basic health care. And for Tommy, that wasn't good enough. Tommy Douglas's leg was saved when a high-priced surgeon eventually agreed to operate for free. He got lucky, but most people weren't so fortunate, and he knew it. Tommy dreamt of universal health care for all Canadians, but he would have to show that it could be done in Saskatchewan first. By 1959, he was ready. I think that medical care is so important that it ought not to have a price tag on it. I think that we have come to the place where medical care, like education, ought to be available to every citizen, irrespective of their financial state. But to make his dream come true, Tommy Douglas would get into the biggest, ugliest political fight of his life. In the red corner, of course, stood Tommy, lean, mean, and ready to go to war. But in the blue corner stood the province's doctors, backed up by the entire North American medical establishment, rich and determined to keep it that way. Doctors in Canada and the States were determined that Medicare's day should never come, in Saskatchewan or anywhere else. And so they threw everything they had at Tommy's plans for universal health care. This is all very dramatic. But Tommy was a boxer. He picked it up when he was a kid, and he wound up winning the Manitoba Lightweight Championships not once, but twice. And he did it, coming in at a thundering 135 pounds, and well, he was barely five foot six. And that's in his shoes. But you know what they say? It's not about the size of the man in the fight. It's about the size of the fight in the man. But with all that being said, these were the doctors. They weren't backing down from anybody. And they were more than willing to play dirty. We are here to say that this is a bad law. And not liking the law, the doctors decided to defy it. This is like asking the doctors if they would like to try a hanging, and if they didn't like it, it could be undone. A strike date was set, and some doctors threatened to leave the province for good. We feel we cannot practice under state-controlled medicine. But Tommy was used to fighting the odds, and he was in no mood to back off. A woman tells me her doctor, whom I could name, told her, you know, you'll just be a number after the plan starts. And I won't be able to keep your secrets. I'll have to pass all the secrets you tell me on to the government. Now this sort of propaganda, in my opinion, is an insult to the intelligence of the people of Saskatchewan. As the strike date loomed, Tommy flew in doctors from overseas. And that's when the Canadian doctors took it to a new low. Racial slurs followed a government announcement that if local doctors wouldn't work under their program, foreign doctors would. Imports were caricatured by a hawk-like nose and an oriental pigtail. And the doctor's threats? Well, they worked. Panic set in, and the public turned on Tommy. When this specialist leave, where will I take my daughter? To Montreal? Will the government pay me transportation? Where will I go? Tell but, me. But, sir, this is not the issue. This well, is the issue. This is my issue. This is the people's issue. Then, on July 1st, 1962, the strike began. And on its very first day, a nine-month-old boy died of meningitis after traveling 90 miles to reach the nearest doctor. And of course, they blamed it all on Tommy. Our greatest Canadian was up against the ropes. And the smart money said he was going down. And healthcare would go down with him.
health care or no health care? So which one was it going to be? This was a huge moment in Canadian history. And forgive me, but a big moment, well, it calls for a big metaphor. That's right. Canada had reached a fork in the road. Now, if Tommy sticks to his guns, then we go down one path. And universal health care, well, it becomes a reality. But if Tommy backs down, well, then the doctors win. And nothing changes. And there's no universal health care. But of course, Tommy didn't back down. The doctors did, abandoning their strike after three weeks. Medicare was duly born. And once it was up and running in Saskatchewan, everyone else wanted a piece. Tommy took his rebellion to Ottawa, and after six long years, the Liberal government couldn't put it off any longer. Medicare went national. Lester Pearson's Liberals even tried to take the credit, but they wouldn't have gone near health care if Tommy hadn't gone first. And the ramifications are huge. And this is what it all boils down to, the 49th parallel. It's the dividing line between our way and their way. And did you know that on that side, every 30 seconds, somebody declares bankruptcy because of medical bills? What I'm saying is, Americans go broke being sick. And I just can't tell you how glad I am that we don't live that way. And it's all thanks to Tommy. We pledged ourselves 50 years ago that we would provide health care for every man, woman, and child, irrespective of their color, their race, or their financial status. And by God, we're going to do it. The 1960s. Our world was changing fast, and we were even looking beyond it. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Back on planet politics, Tommy had taken the fight to the feds. He'd been in Ottawa since 1961 as the first leader of the new Democratic Party. But by the late 60s, there was a younger, groovier generation on the hill. So by now, Tommy was in his 60s. And to be honest, his suits weren't that much younger than he was. We were full on into the television age, and that meant that image was everything. So naturally, people doubted his ability to appeal, especially when he had to go head to head with you know who. Pierre Elliott Trudeau was a politician born to perform on television. Young Canadians flocked to him, and he was more than willing to be flocked. Can I talk to you for a few minutes, please? Yes, go ahead. Oh. <laughs> you mean up in my room? <laughs> Tommy tried his hand at his own brand of Trudeau mania, but somehow it just wasn't quite the same. The programs normally scheduled at this time will not be seen in order to bring you this special program. Now Tommy and Captain Charisma would go head to head in a TV debate. Live and in color from Confederation Hall. In it was all but a foregone conclusion who would claim the day. This Trouble is, nobody told Tommy. I would say to Mr. Trudeau that you can't talk about a just society until he first of all is prepared to commit himself to establishing a just tax structure in this country. Well, naturally, our whole tax structure has to be revised. And there ought to be full disclosure, because people who contribute to a political party could be seeking to buy favors, could be seeking to secure contracts or appointments or patronage at some later date. No, I'm not prepared to make that list public. No, Mr. Trudeau is not the leader of the opposition trying to get into government. He's the, a member of a party that's been in office for five years, and I think that the government must demonstrate something more 
than a last deathbed repentance at this late hour. Trudeau didn't just lose the argument, the guy got pummeled. And more than that, he looked plain weird, oddly uncomfortable in his own skin. Well, there was a reason Trudeau looked uncomfortable in his own skin. It's because he was new to that skin. You see this guy here? Well, he used to be NDP. That's right, I said it. Trudeau was NDP. But then he shifted over to the grits and brought a couple of their ideas along with him. Little things, too, like the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. See, our guy Tommy, well, he presented his Bill of Rights 30 years earlier. In fact, what do you get when you peel away a pier? Well, what you get is a Tommy Douglas. But to be fair to Pierre, he wasn't the only one doing it. In fact, ripping off our boy Tommy, ah, that's what the Liberals did best. Just take a look at what's been lifted from the left. And Tommy can take credit for loads of it. Not just Medicare, but stuff like old age pensions and the minimum wage, right down to free textbooks in schools. He set up North America's first small claims court, and Tommy's Arts Board of Saskatchewan was another first for the continent. And our greatest Canadian was a huge champion of public broadcasting. Oh, well, nobody gets it right all the time. Each and every one of these things was picked up by the governing party when, and only when, it was politically expedient to do so. And yet, despite all those accomplishments, Tommy remained a political outsider. Here in Ottawa, he never ever got the top job. Actually, he was never even the leader of the official opposition. And that raises a question. How does a politician who was never the prime minister get to be the greatest Canadian? Well, because he was uncompromising. And to Tommy, the power of the office didn't mean nearly as much as the power of conviction. Jimmy, one is in politics to obtain power in order to do things. I mean, how does it feel always to be on the sideline and not to be the power? Are you not wasting your time, your energy? Mr. Douglas, you are 61 years old. First of all, I'm not interested in finding a haven. And secondly, I'm not interested in getting power unless you can do something with this power. To I, be have, watched, to have, I power. have watched politicians for the last 40 years uh, drop their principles in order to get power. But if you don't get the top job, you don't get the big statue. Parliament Hill is crawling with statues erected to honor Canada's finest prime ministers. But for every rule, there must be an exception. After all, they made one for her. And she's not even Canadian. So of course, a man with a resume like Tommy Douglas means he's got to have one great statue dedicated to him here at Parliament Hill. So you want to see it? Thank you all for coming. I present to you the Tommy Douglas Memorial. Yep, there it is, a big bag of nothing. As a matter of fact, go wherever you want in the nation's capital and you won't find a single memorial dedicated to the life and work of Tommy Douglas. But I got to tell you something. I think he'd be just fine with that because Tommy's achievements were rivaled only by his humility. And what could be more Canadian than that? Let us raise monuments all over Canada. Monuments in the form of schools and hospitals and libraries, in decent homes for people to live in, in decent roads, in decent conditions, in a Medicare program in adequate health services for every man, woman, and child, irrespective of their income, their age, or their physical condition. These are monuments of which we can be proud. These are monuments that in the day to, days to come, our children will see them, and they will bless us and thank us for those kinds of monuments. Tommy Douglas led the rebellion against an older, uglier version of Canada. He came in on a prairie wind with a vision of a better, brighter country. 
a country where everybody counts and where it's a point of pride that we take care of our most vulnerable citizens. Tommy's values are now Canada's values. He showed us what we could be. But more importantly, he showed us how to get there. There's just no way this country would be what it is today without him. And that's why, without a doubt, Tommy C. Douglas is our greatest Canadian. Honestly, he just leaves everyone else in his dust. Man is now able to fly through the air like a bird. He's able to swim beneath the sea like a fish. He's able to burrow beneath the ground like a mole. Now, if only he could walk the earth like a man, this would be paradise.